Good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Rhonda Henshaw Powell. I'll be your moderator for today. Thank you for joining us for our next in the Knowledge Resource Series webinars. And today we have an exciting presentation for you. And I would like to introduce you to Kupak Farahani, um, our marketing manager for this series. Thank you very much, Kupak. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Pupak Farahani, Marketing Manager at Advanced Cell Diagnostics and your host for today. Welcome to ACD's Knowledge Resource Webinar Series, where we'll give you a closer understanding of how RNA scope technology is contributing to specific application areas. We begin today's knowledge series on a topic of diagnostic applications, presented by Dr. Robert Monroe. Dr. Robert Monroe is the Chief Medical Officer of Biotechni and Advanced Cell Diagnostics. He leads the company's efforts to develop diagnostic and CDS applications with the RNA Scope platform. In his role, Dr. Monroe works with pathologists and researchers to identify unmet clinical needs in biomarker testing and subsequently oversees the development of RNA Scope based tests for these diagnostic applications. Dr. Monroe also serves as a clinical lead in ACD CDX partnerships with Leica Biosystems and multiple biopharma companies for development of CDX assays using RNAscope technology. Dr. Monroe holds an MD PhD from Harvard and is board certified in cytopathology, anatomic pathology, and clinical pathology. With that, we'll get started. Great, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Amrita, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join our webinar this morning. As Amrita uh, noted, we are going to be talking about the diagnostic applications of the RNA scope RNA ish technology this morning. So, I'd like to start with a question why not RNA ish? In other words, <clears throat> Why has RNA-ish not been more widely adopted in both research and diagnostics? The reasons behind this lack of adoption are related to three main issues with RNA-ish. The first issue is the poor sensitivity of the conventional RNA-ish assays. The standard direct labeling methods, uh, an example of which is shown on the right, produce weak signal in the absence of high expressing targets. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this type of application, which includes or incorporates uh, molecules such as digoxygenin into oligonucleotide probes, which are then used for RNA-ish. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, the standard, the standard direct labeling uh, methodology generally produces weak, a weak signal. Uh, unless the targets are expressed at high levels. The second main issue with conventional RNA-ish is that it's just a too difficult of an assay to perform. It's predominantly a manual assay, very time and labor intensive. And finally, the last issue with conventional RNA-ish is that there are few applications. Only a handful of infectious disease probes are commonly used with this technique and other assays for the same markers are generally available uh, with techniques like immunohistochemistry. So the RNA scope technology was developed and first launched in 2010 to address these issues with conventional RNA and situ hybridization. The technology has been optimized to work on routine FFPE tissues, which is really the <clears throat> tissue of choice for anatomic pathology labs as well as researchers. The, the technology utilizes a so-called double Z probe design, which I'll get into in more detail in the subsequent slides, which is designed to enable both signal amplification as well as concurrent background suppression. This allows for detection of all the way down to single messenger RNA molecules or other types of RNA molecules at a single cell resolution under a standard light microscope. Of course, 
other readouts are possible, including uh, fluorescent readouts on a fluorescent microscope. So getting into the nuts and bolts of the double Z technology, each member of a double Z pair uh, depicted here in this slide consists of a target binding region, a linker, and a tail region. When the two members of a double Z pair hybridize along a target RNA molecule, a target specific binding site of about 50 bases is created. The two tail regions are also brought together as a result of the, the target binding <clears throat> to create a preamplifier binding site for sub subsequent signal amplification. A target probe set consists of a pool of 20 or so double Z pairs targeting a length of RNA of approximately 1,000 bases. Of course, the number of pairs can be increased or decreased uh, based on the strength of signal uh, that uh, is desired, uh, but in general, most of the probes that are, the RNA scope technology uh, utilizes are about 20 double Z pairs in length. So how does the signal amplification occur? The process starts with hybridization of a double Z probe pair to the target RNA, creating a preamplifier binding site, which we just went over. Binding of the preamplifier uh, to that preamplifier binding site created by the double Z pair is followed by binding of amplifiers and then label probes. Each double Z probe can incorporate approximately 400 label probes, again, per double Z pair through this strategy. And then since each probe set consists of about 20 of these double Z pairs, this leads to an approximate 8,000 fold amplification uh, for a given RNA scope probe. So what about background suppression? Well, off-target non-specific signal amplification is prevented by the requirement of both members of a double Z pair to bind to the target RNA. If only one member of the, if only one Z probe or one member of the double Z pair binds, then the preamplifier cannot bind to that oligo and generate a signal amplification tree. This strategy therefore leads to suppression of, of background signal and a very clean readout uh, for the end user. Relative to conventional RNA-ish methods that I mentioned uh, in the first couple of slides, RNA scope is approximately 100 times more sensitive as shown here in a direct comparison of RNA scope on the left versus conventional-ish using a, using a digoxygenin labeling approach uh, on the right, in this case for detection of simian immuno, immunodeficiency virus and lymph node tissue. This is similar to the difference that one might uh, <clears throat> see uh, between Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. If any of you have uh, been uh, in America and, and in the holidays and seen this special that comes on every December uh, versus the Christmas tree that grow, goes up in New York City at the Rockefeller Center every year. Since its launch, RNA Scope has been utilized in over 2,700 publications, spanning a wide range of fields from cancer to infectious disease to immunotherapy and on down the list. These publications have appeared in the top journals as well as the top journals in, in the specialty areas, uh, including neurology, pathology, and on down the list, as I mentioned. So what are the formats for RNA scope? <clears throat> RNA scope is available in multiple formats, including manual as well as automated. The manual kits themselves, shown here, require in addition to the reagents, a hybridization oven that maintains temperature and humidity and are otherwise performed at the bench. The automated versions of the assay include reagents designed for a Leica Bond RX as well as the Ventana Discovery instrument. In the US as well as the EU, 
uh, automation is available on one clinical platform, the Leica Bond 3. Again, the Leica Bond 3 is an IVD platform, while the Leica Bond RX and the Ventana Discovery instruments are so called RUO, or research use only instruments. Automation really provides for a seamless fit into clinical, into clinical laboratory and pathology workflows, starting with routine formal and fixed paraffin embedded specimens. Lab staff simply load these pre-filled trays of RNA scope reagents onto the automated platform, select the RNA scope protocol, and then return in approximately 10 hours to retrieve the slides for delivery to the pathologist or the researcher for microscopic review. This workflow is highly similar to the IHC workflow, which makes it very easy for labs to incorporate RNA scope along their IHC stains. Several of the main diagnostic applications of RNA scope are highlighted in this slide. In fact, one of the main drivers of RNA scope adoption across the world is its ability to address challenges with IHC, including issues with high background with certain antibodies and IHC assays, as well as issues with low expression or antibodies and expression of, of their protein targets are difficult to uh, discriminate from background staining. Another application of RNA scope is as a chromogenic replacement or surrogate for fluorescent in situ hybridization assays. For example, gene amplifications, MDM2 uh, in the case of liposarcoma diagnosis is one example of an amplification uh, that is amenable to analysis with RNA scope. Similarly, gene fusions and translocations uh, can be assessed through RNA scope assays, for example, ALK or ALK in lung cancer. Last but not least, RNA scope is an extremely powerful method for infectious disease detection, including bacterial detection of organisms like H. pylori, Bartonella hensile, mycobacteria, and on down the list, as well as viral detection of viruses such as HPV, CMV, EBV, and as I'll get to later in the presentation of relevance to what's happening in the world today, SARS-CoV-2. Starting with that first diagnostic application that I mentioned, albumin is a great example of an RNA scope assay that addresses the high background issues that can arise with some IHC assays. Albumin, as many of you know, is a major component of serum and consequently is present at low levels in almost all vascularized tissue, contributing to high background staining with albumin IHC. RNA scope gets around this issue with multiple groups having published on the utility of albumin RNA-ish in the differentiation of primary liver tumors from extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas and metastatic adenocarcinomas. The algorithm for the use of albumin is indicated in the lower right of the slide, where positive staining for albumin indicates either a hepatocellular carcinoma or an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, whereas negative staining indicates a metastatic adenocarcinoma or an extrahepatic or bile duct carcinoma. Another example of RNA scope addressing issues with IHC is the valuation of aminoglobulin kappa and lambda light chain restriction in the context of B cell lymphomas. Many B cell lymphomas have quite weak light chain expression in contrast to more mature B cell neoplasms like myelomas. In these cases, IHC for Ig kappa and Ig lambda generally are quite weak. There's a, not much of a signal. Uh, to discriminate true expression from the high background, again, with standard IHC. However, the application of RNA scope to the analysis of these lymphomas uh, has shown very strong performance. In a comparison with gold standard flow cytometry, RNA scope kappa and lambda uh, results were concordant with flow cytometry in 108 of 109 valuable cases in a publication 
that came out of Cleveland Clinic in 2013. So just to highlight the difference uh, between uh, the positive and negative signals with RNA scope kappa and lambda versus immunohistochemistry for kappa and lambda, I've included this panel uh, below, where you can see again, in this example of a LAM Ig lambda restricted lymphoma, a very weak expression by protein. It's hard to discriminate from kappa expression. Whereas the RNA scope signal for lambda is very strong and there's essentially no signal for the kappa. Ig kappa and lambda can also be performed in a duplex format allowing for clear-cut evaluation of light chain restriction on one slide. The same group or some of the same investigators out of, out of Cleveland Clinic have published on this duplex assay uh, shown in the lower right uh, using red for Ig kappa and black for Ig lambda. In the panel on the right, uh, you can see an example of an Ig uh, kappa restricted lymphoma on the, in the top uh, two images with kappa in red and lambda in black. Again, you can see the predominance of the red and almost complete absence of black indicating light chain restriction with immunoglobulin kappa. And an example of lambda restriction on the bottom where you see all black and essentially no red. So the duplex assay really makes the assay easier to interpret as you only have to look at one slide. Moving on to the second main diagnostic application that I noted uh, for the application of RNA scope to the analysis of both gene fusions as well as amplifications, I've highlighted a few of the major applications on this slide, a few of the major bio biomarkers that are amenable to RNA scope evaluation. So, without getting into too much detail, I just wanted to mention. Uh, publications and highlight a few images for some of these applications, including the application of MDM2 for the analysis of lipomatous tumors. In essence, uh, expression of MDM2 correlates with the malignant version of lipomatous tumors, which are called liposarcomas, uh, while the benign versions of these tumors are generally negative uh, with the RNA scope assay for MDM2. Similarly for ALK, uh, the detection of high levels of, of ALK mRNA is indicative of an ALK gene fusion in the context of non-small cell lung carcinomas. Essentially, the, as, the RNA scope assay is a surrogate for the gene fusion, which can also be confirmed or verified uh, by fluorescent in situ hybridization techniques. Finally, NTREC analysis is becoming uh, more and more common uh, as we find that NTREC gene fusions can occur in virtually any type of tumor. And therefore, patients who've run out of options for other types of treatments are often assessed and have, often their tumors are assessed for NTREC uh, fusions. The assay uh, that we've de developed at ACD for NTREC incorporates uh, all three NTREC genes uh, in a way uh, that allows for assessment of gene fusions in involving any of these genes in a single assay. So moving on to the infectious, infectious disease applications of the RNA scope technology. The most widely used diagnostic application for RNA scope uh, to date is for the detection of HPV in various tissue types, including head and neck cancers, cervical dysplasia, and cervical cancers. In fact, the RNA scope HPV assay has been widely published with over 140 publications utilizing the probes to date, a few of which are highlighted here. The HPV assays include probes for both high-risk as well as low-risk HPV types. The probes themselves target uh, the E6, E7 mRNA, which is contained on a single transcript 
uh, for each type. And these probes allow for type dis specific discrimination with no cross reactivity uh, between types. So for example, a probe for HPV-16 is specific uh, and will not detect any other, specific for HPV-16 and will not detect other HPV types. The type-specific probes can be used individually or pooled in various combinations. For example, HPV-6 and 11 are common low-risk types uh, that people are often interested in running alone while 16, 18, 31, and 33 are some of the more common high-risk types and are often uh, in, <clears throat> of interest for labs to run alone as well. It's also quite possible to combine them in pairs or even uh, larger numbers uh, to put together cocktails for coverage of multiple high-risk and low-risk types. The most common and popular cocktail uh, that's used for evaluation, particularly of, of head and neck cancers, includes probes for 18 high-risk subtype, subtypes that have been implicated in a subtype of uh, head and neck cancer called oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So taking a step back uh, from the RNA scope technology, I wanted to review uh, why people are interested in HPV status uh, in these in these in certain tumor types, particularly in in the oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma uh, that I just mentioned, and there therefore why uh, people have interest in the RNA scope assays for HPV. So going back uh, several years uh, to 2010. A New England Journal of, Medi of Medicine study of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma patients uh, were enrolled in a random, randomized trial comparing different treatments. In a retrospective analysis of 323 tumor samples from these patients for HPV status, uh, which had a median follow up of five years, uh, demonstrated that HPV positive tumors showed a significantly improved overall and disease-free survival relative to the HPV negative uh, patients. The HPV status was determined by DNA-ish as well as P16-IHC. Many of you know that P16 is a good surrogate marker for HPV presence. And so the Kaplan-Meier curves, which include 95% confidence intervals, are shown here for DNA-ish and P16. Uh, with the HPV positive uh, patients indicated in the top, in the top line of the Kaplan-Meier curve relative to the HPV, HPV negative patients, indicating that those HPV positive patients assessed with either DNA-ish or P16 had a much improved five-year survival relative to the HPV negative uh, patients. So based on this landmark study, as well as many other studies that followed this study. It's now very well established that patients with HPV positive uh, tumors uh, of the head and neck, including oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, have a significantly improved overall and disease-free survival in comparison to those patients with HPV negative tumors. And as a result of this, HPV status is now being used for selection of patients for less aggressive treatment as well as new therapies that include de-intensification of radiation and chemotherapy, as well as immunotherapies such as pd one Furthermore, the NCCN guidelines that are used by oncologists in the US as well as across the world uh, in their guidelines for oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma published in 2018, they recommend testing for HPV status. So why not just use P16 IHC as it's uh, generally uh, become um, over the last several years since the publication of these papers, the most widely used method for HPV protection in oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. The sensitivity is quite high for HPV. And again, that's determined uh, by comparison to a gold standard method of 
HPV E6, E7 mRNA expression by RT-PCR. However, E16 overexpression can also be uh, found as a result of activation of other pathways independent of HPV, which has led to interest in more specific assays. And among those assays, DNA-ish has been evaluated as well as the RNA scope assay for HPV. So without getting into all of the publications, uh, suffice it to say that there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, that's gone into uh, comparing these different methodologies for assessing HPV uh, in these oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. And when you combine or do a meta-analysis of these papers uh, and look at the combined results of multiple papers, in this case, the, the three that are indicated in the bottom right, uh, you see that the RNA scope uh, assay in comparison to DNA-ish and P16-IHC not only is the only assay that shows direct evidence of HPV activity, but also has the highest sensitivity as well as specificity. In comparison to P16, the sensitivity is just as high as equivalent and the specificity is significantly greater. So again, that's the important point. The sensitivity is as good as P16-IHC, but the specificity is significantly greater. So this is an example of a head and neck tumor uh, showing, H showing P16 uh, positivity in the absence of HPV. The top panel shows a oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma where RNA scope for HPV is strongly positive as well as P16 IHC. However, the laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma in the bottom panel shows completely negative staining for HPV by RNA scope uh, with a strong signal by P16 IHC. We know from the PCR analysis that in fact, this case was negative for HPV. So this is a, a perfect example of a false positive or a case in which P16 uh, was activated by a pathway independent of HPV. So why do these false positives with P16 IHC make any difference? Well, this issue was investigated in a study pu published last year in the British Journal of Cancer uh, and replicated in a couple of other publications since then, uh, which looked at five-year overall survival in a cohort of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma patients according to P16 as well as HPV RNA scope status. So if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right, you'll see that the P16 positive, HPV positive uh, patients indicated in red showed that favorable uh, five-year prognosis with improved survival relative to the other patients. However, the P16 positive, HPV negative RNA scope patients indicated uh, in the Blue, blue line on the Kaplan-Meier curve had significantly reduced five-year survival, similar to the P16 negative patients indicated by the black line. So HPV RNA scope testing as demonstrated in this analysis, in this study, is more specific for determination of HPV status and the favorable prognosis that goes along with it. And the fact that P16 IHC uh, <clears throat> is can lead to patients falling on one of these poor prognosis curves indicates that reliance on this assay is quite risky. So this data has really been uh, used by key opinion leaders uh, to develop uh, several algorithms for the use of RNA scope in the analysis and evaluation of patients with oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas for HPV. In fact, um, many opinion leaders uh, have suggested that the first algorithm shown here uh, should be 
used for determining HPV status, especially when guiding therapy, where the RNA scope assay is used up front to determine HPV positive versus HPV negative tumors. If labs insist on using P16 IHC, uh, the opinion leaders recommend that any P16 positive case go on for RNA scope testing to confirm that presence of HPV. With the HPV positive tumors uh, then going on for uh, the re reduction in, in chemotherapy and radiation, while the HPV negative tumors would go on for standard therapies. So this really indicates um, the importance of a not only HPV testing of these tumors, but of using the right HPV assay to get to the correct HPV status for these tumors and the correct treatment uh, for these patients. So what are some other applications for RNA scope HPV beyond head and neck cancer and oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma? Well, the assay is very useful in several other settings uh, listed here, including endocervical glandular dysplasia and endocervical carcinomas, including the in situ variant called AIS, as well as in the differential diagnosis of endocervical versus endometrial adenocarcinoma. It's also very useful uh, when metastatic squamous cell carcinomas arise uh, with unknown primary sites. If those tumors end up being positive for HPV, uh, one can, can, can conclude that they're either derived from a cervical site or the head and neck region. And finally, the RNA scope HPV assays are very useful for evaluation of squamous dysplasia and carcinoma of multiple genital sites, including the cervix, where we know there's a lot of uh, biopsies and evaluation of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia uh, <clears throat> to screen for the presence of precursor lesions to cervical cancer. So similar to the comparison of RNA scope in the area of cervical dysplasia, and we know from multiple studies that P16 is not a reliable biomarker for distinguishing a low-grade version of cervical dysplasia known as CIN1 or low-grade squamous and intraepithelial lesion from negative cases, completely benign cervical uh, biopsies, since the majority of these low-grade lesions are negative for P16. In fact, some recommendations out of uh, professional organizations, including C the CAP, the College of American Pathology, as well as the ASCCP, which is a gynecologic uh, society, uh, don't recommend P16 for assessment of these lesions. This is really this really opened up an area of unmet need uh, where RNA scope uh, was tested, and that's for uh, a biomarker for low-grade dysplasia. So just a few examples of how it performs in the context of low-grade dysplasia evaluation. In, a, in the case of a normal, normal cervical biopsy where uh, because of uh, various factors such as inflammation, uh, you can have mimics of low-grade dysplasia, uh, evaluation for HPV becomes important. And in these scenarios, uh, H&E analysis is often imperfect and doesn't lead one to the correct evaluation for HPV status. But the application of RNA scope in this setting, as shown here, is very uh, helpful in discriminating between these uh, true dysplastic lesions versus the benign, the benign counterparts. Similarly, uh, when you compare the performance of the RNA-ish assay for these low-grade lesions versus P16 immunohistochemistry, the RNA-ish assay has a much higher level of sensitivity for detection of these lesions. 
I should note that P16, you see a few scattered positive cells, but the, what's considered positive for a P16 stain is 70% uh, staining of cells, including both nuclear and cytoplasmic staining. So this lesion shows nowhere near 70% uh, staining, where you get a very clear and robust RNA-ish signals with the RNA scope assay. So there's a number of publications that have highlighted uh, the high sensitivity and specificity of the RNA scope assay for low grade dysplasia or SIN1 when it's used in combination with standard H&E morphology. So the last application that I'd like to, to go over this morning, again, relates to our current uh, COVID-19 crisis. So very early on, uh, dating back to January, we began receiving requests as a company for a probe specific uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus that could not only identify different uh, messenger RNAs uh, produced by the virus, but also would allow for discrimination from other uh, coronaviruses and SARS viruses, such as MERS and SARS-CoV-1. So the assay uh, that we developed uh, that's become uh, the more most widely used uh, probe is an RNA scope assay uh, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein mRNA, again, for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 in, in FFP human tissues. The intended use is obviously for the detection of the virus in these tissues, which include lung specimen from patients, uh, both living as well as uh, post-mortem cases, uh, as well as other tissues that are known to be involved by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, such as placenta, kidney, heart, liver, pharynx, and other organs. So this slide highlights the specificity of the assay. This is an example of a post-mortem case uh, where lung tissue was evaluated for SARS-CoV-2 virus. The negative control probe is shown on the left where you, <clears throat> in combination with an H&E uh, stain. So you see none of the red signal. In this case, a red chromogen uh, was used uh, <clears throat> for the RNA scope assay. In contrast, the SARS-CoV-2 probe shows a very robust red signal along uh, the alveolar walls. In fact, this staining uh, that's observed with the bright red correlates to so-called hyaline membranes, which are common as an end stage in, in many uh, pneumonias that result in a process called diffuse alveolar damage. So this is one of the patterns that was has been commonly seen across uh, uh, many patients who've been examined uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Again, two main patterns uh, have emerged uh, with this probe. The pattern on the left is the so-called pneumocyte pattern where you see scattered uh, type two pneumocytes lining the alveolar air spaces uh, showing infection uh, with SARS-CoV-2 as indicated by the red positivity. Whereas on the right, you see that pattern that I just described where much of the RNA and much of the viral detection is occurring in these hyaline membranes uh, that are formed from cellular debris from dying cells, as well as macrophage uh, there to, that are there in the alveoli to clean up uh, these dead cells as a result of high levels of SARS-CoV-2 infection. The assay uh, has been used in a number of publications, a couple of which are highlighted here. Notably, uh, there was a New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, that highlighted um, not only staining in the lung, again, this is an example of an alveolar pattern similar to what I just showed you, uh, but also showed presence of the virus in kidneys. So this was the first report uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the kidney. Um, so the RNA scope assay is quite useful 
in picking up low levels of the virus in, in many of these other organs where uh, the primary infection is not found, but um, there's been indications that the virus is present. Another uh, interesting finding is the presence of the virus in placental tissue of COVID-19 patients. So you can see here the chorionic villi of a placenta indicating that the virus can be transmitted vertically uh, from a COVID-19 positive mother uh, to an unborn infant uh, through the placenta. So I'd like to uh, finish uh, the discussion this evening just by highlighting um, a few other applications uh, listed here. We have a set of panels uh, that apply to different areas of anatomic pathology. Some of the applications that uh, are coming along and are showing great promise are highlighted in red, uh, including MIB for the evaluation of salivary gland tumors, CHIRT for the evaluation of uh, genitourinary and gynecologic tumors, and PRAME for the evaluation of uh, melanocytic lesions of the skin. As a result of the performance, the high, high level of performance of the assay and a variety of infectious diseases, including HPV and SARS-CoV-2 that we've been talking about, we're also developing applications for detection of influenza as a way to evaluate uh, patients uh, that we anticipate are going to be uh, hospitalized with pneumonias in the coming months where there may be issues with discriminating between SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses. So without getting into the details of these other applications, I just wanted to finish by saying that this technology is also uh, being adapted to uh, future types of applications, including point mutation detection. The version of this, the assay that's being developed for this type of analysis is called Basescope. And if any of you are interested, uh, we would be happy to both answer questions as well as provide information on this version of the technology that's successfully been used for detecting mutations such as KRAS, G12C, BRAF, V600E, and multiple EGFR mutations. Thank you very much, Rob. That was an excellent presentation. And um, let me pass back to Pupak for a few moments. Thank you. This ends our presentation portion of the event. So before we open all questions for Dr. Moreau, I'd like to let you know that we'll have more knowledge resources webinars in the upcoming weeks.